Welcome to the Surfcast Podcast, your weekly source for surf fishing discussions, tactics, interviews, news, and more. The Surfcast Podcast is hosted by Jerry Audette and Toby Lipinski, two of the most dedicated and obsessed surf fishermen that you will ever meet. The tide is up, the wind is at our back, so let's hit the surf. Welcome to a special edition of the Surfcast Podcast. I'm Toby. And I am Jerry. And today we've got two very special guests, Frank and Joy Stanio. Uh, many of you know who they are. I uh, figured I'd fill you in a little bit on how I got to know both of you, essentially, through the years. When I was little, <clears throat> my dad had a subscription to the Fisherman magazine, and I saw Frank's articles in, in my, as I, I've joked before, I somewhat learned to read from the Fisherman magazine. And as I got older, Obviously, started reading your books, got into surf fishing. Uh, you know, twenty years on the Cape essentially became my Bible when I would go and fish the Cape. Um, have all the books, and they're all well worn and notes and everything along the way. And really became uh, really what I became as a surf fisherman based originally on a lot of your writings, Frank. And then eventually, I joined. I started working for the Fisherman Magazine, and you were one of the first guys that I spoke with, one of the first writers. Once I became the editor of the New England edition, oh. we had a couple of emails back and forth. And oh. I'll tell okay. you, at the end of that day, I went home and I told my wife, I was like, you'll never guess who I was talking with today. I was so excited to finally have a chance to actually speak to you on a, you know, a one-to-one basis. Because I'd met actually both of you before, Joyce and, and Frank, at a couple of the fishing shows. I remember the Worcester fishing show. I don't know if that's still on now, but it was... 98 or 99 somewhere in that range i went to to see you speak and i had 20 years on the cape with me you had finished your presentation and i was waiting to get you have you sign it and i actually was there's sitting still next a, to there's you. still a few around being sold it, it, but uh the one that's getting active is the second one striper surf oh yes excellent book. i just this week i got a a royalty check for striper surf which was written 32 years ago. <laughs> it's amazing. It it's, came out 32 years ago. Yeah, it's, it's a amazing. great, it's a great book. No, I but no. Absolutely. Let me tell you, the royalty check was not huge. <laughs> <laughs> it's something imagine. though. <laughs> what imagine. was it? Sixty nine dollars. Sixty three. Nice. Hey, that's <laughs> that's more than the, I've never made a royalty check on a book, so that's that's something to say. And, it's and amazing. You know that that day when I saw both you, I had I was talking with you, Joyce, and I, I asked you to sign the book. And we kind of laughed for a minute. You didn't want to sign where you know Frank's name was. So you signed on your fifty, mm-hmm. your photo of your fifty. And mm-hmm. I, I still I have that with me here today. I mean, I still look through that book, and every time I hit that page, I, I remember back to that moment. It's a fun, very fond memory. And of course, then I got a chance to speak with you that day, Frank, and you signed it as well. And um, I, after that, I told a couple of my friends that I had both of you signed it that way, and they all saw it. So you probably, Joyce, you start, probably started getting hit up a bit more after that point. But, uh, so yeah, it, it's been a, a, I feel like I've known both of you for quite some time. And actually, you know, on a one-on-one basis, really today would be the first time we've actually ever sat down to just talk. So I, I thank you both, you know, in advance of, of the rest of this recording for taking the time out of your day um, to sit with us. Yeah. You see that fish up there? Yeah. That's yours? Mm-hmm. It's uh, representative because yeah. it's got a lot more than I have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, that's yeah, wonderful. That's mine. <laughs> wow. That's a 50 you... even. Yeah. That's a pipsqueak. <laughs> <laughs> I got that's one a... downstairs that, that's 52. Mm-hmm. Which, if you know anybody that wants it, they can have it. <laughs> because it's not, it's not the, it's a skin mount. Yeah. This is a, uh, a Wally Brown Yes. Much more popular because oh, yeah. there's no fish there. Yeah, the one downstairs is fish. It's it's, it's a stuffed. Yeah. yeah. I have a, my friend got a 55 one night when we were fishing the surf together. Yeah. And he had a skin mount made of it. And he had it on the wall at his house for several years. And when his daughter got a couple of cats, the cats took interest in it. And they would climb the wall to try to get at it. And he got up one morning to go to work. And it had popped off and was hanging just by one of the two hooks. So he had to take it down. He's like, I'm going to let you hold on to this until I have a place where I can safely have it. So I have a skin mount as well on the wall. And you can definitely see the difference. It's, yeah. it's neat that, to know it's the fish. That's a Wally Brown. 
But that's a Wally Brown, what they call a replica mount. Yeah, yeah that's it's beautiful. beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. Much less, it doesn't change at all. Mm -hmm. Skin mounts change. Yes. They turn, turn kind of like yellow, brown. And yeah. They're not nice. Need the repairs over time. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, mine, mine is just, isn't didn't damage. Mm -hmm. But it, it 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 it's just not was it's never been as nice as that is. Yeah, mm. that's really no. nice. And by the way, these fish, the small fish, I mounted those myself. Oh wow! He's pointing at a couple of trout. Yeah. <laughs> that's a seven pound sea run brown. Sea run brown. Wow. Oh my god! I, I caught that in Munakis Bay, in Tidewater, mm -hmm. on January nineteenth, which was our anniversary. <laughs> Great way to spend the anniversary. <laughs> yeah, I, and I was I took I took a sick day from work because I like I like fishing in the winter time for sea run browns, which doesn't that, that run's gone now, mm -hmm. and that rainbow is Pulaski, in New York. I mounted that one, but I didn't like the paint job, so I paid a guy who from, from Waltham. Uh, what was his name? Rocco. Huh? Rocco. No, it wasn't Rocco. Well, it doesn't matter. Was it Rocco? I used to know. I'll probably think of it after they're gone. <laughs> but yeah. but I, I didn't like the paint job, so I paid this guy 50 bucks to uh, to paint it. I mounted it, but he painted it. Mm. Yeah. It's nice. Let's see, what else is there? Yeah. Oh, there's a brook trout in my office that, uh, that Joyce caught in... Uh, what was the name of that creek in Maine? The river in Maine. It runs into Moosehead. Where you caught that foot I know, I know, but I can't think of it. So on, on your side, Jerry, how did you get to know or become aware of, of Frank and, and Joyce and everything? So I came to Frank much later than you, obviously. T Toby has a lot more experience surf casting than I do, since he was surf casting before I was born. <laughs> but um, I came to Frank much later. And I'll tell you, um, I was one of those guys who wanted to consume every single bit of content I, pro I possibly could. You know, these days it seems like a lot of people are stuck on social media looking for their answers there, which is fine. There's good stuff there, too. There's a lot of bad stuff. When I started, YouTube had barely started. It like wasn't even really a thing. It like had just barely sort of started coming around. So I was online looking for anything, and I found your site. I found your your oh, your stripersurf.com. Yeah, stripersurf. And so that was the first place I had stumbled upon you. And then I remember I got one of your books um, from the library, and I looked at it and I read it in the library, and it sort of just went from there. The thing that really connected me to you, besides our sort of similar um, takes on writing and me viewing your writing as you know, something I wanted to sort of aspire to, was your love of the Cape. That was the thing that I felt connected most to you. Because when I go out to the sand beaches of the Cape, I could just, I could stand there and catch nothing and be happier than I would being catching 30s and 40s in a lot of other places. You know, I don't have as much of an interest as, I'm not going to fish the canal. I don't, there's a lot of places in Buzzards Bay or in Rhode Island even. I I don't have as much interest. We have, we got a lot of 50 pounders in Rhode Island. Rhode Island fishing can be amazing and I still fish Rhode Island. But there's something about the Outer Cape to me that really speaks to me. And I get that from your writing. And so that was like, oh, you know, then I wanted to consume everything you wrote because that's how I felt. And so I felt like that was my connection to you was all of the Outer Capes. Now, one of my questions, and this is a side question actually, in your book, 20 Years on the Cape, you talk about the section where the beach gets really narrow and the dunes get really huge. Yeah, that's, that's in Wal scary Balston. Narrow. That's in Balston. <laughs> that was Balston. Just, so south, just south of, the, of Cape Cod Light. Okay, uh, so yeah. that's what, I was wondering exactly where you were, because I was, I mean, I know those backside beaches pretty well, but I was wondering. I, I called it Scary Narrow. <laughs> yeah. And what you do is, you're in your buggy, and you start watching the waves, and you notice every, like, I'm making it up, but every third wave is a little less of a wave than the other two, so you go one, two, three, and gun it, and <laughs> dive through, and 
and get to the other side and the wave was following you. <laughs> you just got but it. you had to get in there because that's where the fish were. Boston was a was a red hot place. Uh, I got one, didn't I get one of my 50s at Boston? Mm -hmm. You got your 50 at uh, the Mission Bell. Mm -hmm. uh, she got a 49. Can I go on? She yeah, got, of course. She got a 49 at Chatham Inlet. And uh, we were, the tide was slowing down and the fishing was lousy. So we were all sitting in a buggy and these yo yo's were all smoking, I think. The way those doobies were glowing, I think I think they were doobies. I I I smoked cigarettes, but I never smoked the dope. We're sitting in a in the buggy, and I says to Joyce, "Be very casual, walk out ho hum slow, because I says the tide is changing, and they when the tide changes, the fish change their positions, and you get a fresh slug of possibility. So ho hum." I stay in the truck and she walks slowly down to the water and makes a cast and these guys are all right. She hooks a fish. It turned out it was 49 pounds <laughs> and these guys are casting over her head. All right. Some of those, some of those clowns were really clowns. It was, uh, you know, that's terrible. I mean, it's good to know that that's existed back then because that's still a problem these days. It does not change. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. the casting over yeah. Is, a, yeah. is a serious problem, especially I know the last few years in New Jersey when the fishing's been really good and the crowds have been terrible. They're all casting over the tops of each other's heads and stuff, and it's terrible. Oh, that's awful. I, yeah, it's I awful. Would, I would move. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. I don't it's, know if you can, if in Jersey you can even move. It's probably, no matter where you're going, they're going to be there. Yeah, well, that, that is the thing. Yeah, yeah certainly. It's, it's, it gets hammered. Yeah, so. the last, and the way the fishing has been there, the last two falls, for better or worse, it's even, it's good fishing, so there's even more, more people, more, people, more pressure. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we should talk about some of the things that I, some of the mistruths that I grew up with because I was just a kid and my father was kind of a gu uh, a googan. Mm -hmm. He was a nice guy, but and he was a good hunter. But we used to fish off the Warren River Bridge and we 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 caught stripers. I caught my first striper there when I was twelve on the Warren Warren River Bridge. It's a popular spot. Mm -hmm. Once it got dark, everybody would go off the bridge because we all knew that striped bass can't see at night. <laughs> That's a pretty serious mistruth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wish more people what are you believe that. that? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Yeah, so there were a lot of mistruths. So there was a secret. We heard through the grapevine that you can catch them in the dark. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Then you spent years trying to prove that, right? <laughs> so I think the first place that I caught them in the dock was uh, it's a little outflow in Bristol Harbor. And uh, I started catching them in the dock. And then I, I, uh, I went fishing with a bunch of guys. We used to play cards in the wintertime. And then we'd go striper fishing in the summer. And... Uh, I taught those guys that you can catch them at night. So we used to make, we used to go these trips to the mouth of the Westport River. We didn't have any buggies. They, they hadn't really invented the buggy in those days. I think some people were doing it, but they, kept, they didn't tell anybody. I don't know. But we didn't have a buggy. So we, we, we played, we used to play cards, huh? At home in the wintertime. And we, we'd, we trade homes to play cards. Mm. I think it was a quarter a hand, something like that. And we had a good time. Then we'd go fishing in the summertime. Uh, so did so, huh? you know? You just mentioned fishing at night. Yeah. Do you, you know? We talk about this a lot, him and I. 
I prefer to fish at night. Even if fishing was better during the day, I, I would too. still fish at night. Do you feel that way? Yeah, well, for one thing, they can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not talking, are you talking about the fish or the people can't see you? Both. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's right. That's what I thought, yeah. But uh, I caught my first 50, 50, it was a 52. I got, I sold it to a restaurant for five bucks. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, that was, that was 10 cents a pound. Mm-hmm. That was decent money. Yeah. We didn't sell that one, though. Yeah, it wouldn't walk. You know? Yeah. I often wonder what, after he took the impression, or if he already had an impression, Wally Brown, and he sold her fish. For, <laughs> it, he probably sold the actual fish. Yeah. And got decent money for it. But he, he got decent money from us for mounting that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's a great, it's a great... Uh, I am so proud of what Joyce has done. She's caught probably, Matt, well, she, she's got 150, I got seven. You know why there's a difference? She's babysitting. Mm-hmm. She's watching the kids. And, it, and once the kids were, all, were gone, that's when she got her 50. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They were, the kids weren't with us. They were, they were gone, they were, I think they were in college. Mm-hmm. Well, both were at, one was at Mass Maritime and the other one was at uh, Coast Guard Academy. That's when you got your 50. Mm-hmm. So And you, Dickie was gone. You've had, I mean, who knows even how many 30s and 40s, but you've got seven 50s. Yeah. 50 really mattered? You really felt like that was a... Oh, yeah, that was... Yeah, it was yeah, I don't know why we used to pray for... No matter how many you had, you prayed for another 50. Yeah. You know? And it it, it kind of... It kind of followed you. It, it, uh, the one that I got downstairs, at the 52 pounder was the first one. No, the first one I sold for five bucks. The second one I caught at Green Hill on that stupid Junior Adam that was overloaded with, Bob Pond loaded his Junior Adam and he was experimenting with it and he gave it to me. I said to myself, he gave me this piece of shit because he didn't want it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <clears throat> so now I'm fishing in uh, Green Hill. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I, when I was, when we went to Green Hill, that was Columbus weekend. I bought, I bought, I, 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 the bait, the bait shop was closed, but I had some squid from the freezer. So I put a, a line out with the squid and, uh, stood beside the squid uh, outfit, and which I knew would not catch anything, and I threw that stupid plug, which I know was certain wasn't going to catch anything. And I got a 52, 50 something. It wasn't a 53, because I, I didn't get a 53 till later. I think it was 51 or 52. Mm-hmm. On, the, on the loaded Junior Adam that Pond gave me. That's amazing. This gets better, so hang on. The, that was in a fall. That was Columbus weekend. I got a 50, 50 something pounder. I never got a fifty three, and I don't think I ever got a fifty. I got a fifty ones and fifty twos. So, so, uh, so the following year, we're on the East Beach side, and in Rhode Island, and I keep my eels in the back, in a in a car, mm-hmm. in a back pond. They're not Nippon, Nipson, oh. Ninigret. Ninigret. Yep. And I keep them in a cage, live eels. Well, some son of a bitch either stole them or let them go so that I wouldn't be able to catch nothing. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh. Like competition between Yeah, these. not competition, petty jealousy. Oh, okay. Mm. Well, maybe a combination of both. So I go in the back. And my eel caught, my eel box, it's just got a little cover on it. It's open and the eels are gone. Now what do I got to do? Yeah. So, I look in my kit. I don't have many plugs because I'm an eel guy. Ah, there's that Bob Pond loaded plug. So I says, I'll screw it. I'll fish with that. It's a dog anyway, but I was a little depressed. 
So I'm fishing with the with the Bob Pond dog. I get another fifty pounds. <laughs> <laughs> had you fished it much in between? Like, had you even really taken it out and used it? You know, I mean, you got a fifty, and then you got another fifty. Like in between, did you really it's, use it at all? No, wait a minute. No, the the, the, the stories are, are not in order. Okay. She. Uh, you're putting too much pressure on me on my timing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just well, my well, my curiosity is, you you know you had it and you were like this thing's not this thing's a piece of crap it's not going to work and then you had a fifty. Did you try using it more after that? No, no. Yeah. I hated that plug. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> but I was, I was I was kind of self self pity. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. To, to fish with that stupid plug because it's it does it, it goes through the water like a stone. It mm -hmm. doesn't it doesn't doesn't swim. It's too heavy. Yeah, mm -hmm. I got another. I think that was number three. Mm -hmm. I think so. Anyway, let's let's read ba back up. Green Hill in the fall and uh, summer. I think July. I got I got that that fifty pound. It's it's uh, on, on the plug you hated. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I I still won't give that plug credit because I expect the plug to do a sachet going through the water, and this thing doesn't sachet. It's just it's just it's just nothing. like a sterile woman. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> There's a Frankism. Yeah, that's a Frankism for you. So Frank, let me ask you, why the striped bass? Why did it hold your oh. attention all these years? I mean, you got all these other fish you could do. You put all of this work into it. I mean, even making good money. Why the striped bass? Why? What is well, it about the, the striped it's bass? The, it's the only thing that you can get around here that's going to take line off your reel. Mm. Now, you're, you're pushing a button. You may not know it, but you're pushing a button. Okay, great. <laughs> During the moratorium, we could not fish for striped bass. So we, we went on a love affair during the moratorium for Atlantic salmon. And we went to uh, Quebec, Garde de la Mouche. You know what that is? No. Watch your fly, but it's in French. <laughs> but but did the salmon hold your attention the way the striped bass did? Like, yes. It, they did. Mm -hmm. really and, did. And, and, and we also, it also is done in the daytime, which is a real treat. Okay. <laughs> you really liked it. Was yeah. it the challenge of the salmon that you think was able to hold you, or well, the was... whole experience yeah. around it? Yeah, yeah. The salmon is very, very. Oh, I knocked the balls off the salmon. You know what I learned? This is a secret. <laughs> <laughs> the riffle hitch. Tie the tie the when you you put you put the fly on a conventional way. And you put one turn around the neck of the fly and another turn around the neck of the fly. So that this causes, if it's in current, and salmon are always in current, you cast this out and you let it swing in the current and it riffles. Mm. The salmon will sell their mothers to get that, to hit that riffle hitch. And these mainers, I had one of them tell me one time, I know what you're doing, you're riffling. This is not a riffling river. I caught five Atlantic salmon one morning in a pool, what they call a pool. It's just a spot where everybody fishes. I caught five Atlantic salmon when 15 guys couldn't catch two combined. Yeah. And after they made fun of my riffle, this is not a riffling river, they still would not riffle their flies. And I've been riffling for trout, I've been riffling for everything, including striped bass. Hmm. That was one of When I went back to striped bass fishing after the moratorium re went, went down and they reopened, I was catching stripers riffling. Mm -hmm. But the riffling is a, is a very, very good... I've had a circus writing about it. And you know who told me that? Lee, Lee Wolf, oh, in his uh. book. Because the riffling... The riffling got started year, years ago in the 1800s. The uh, British, the British are big salmon fishermen, mm -hmm. and they they would come across the Atlantic, and they would stop in a camp. 
because the camp had flies for them to use. But the flies were so old that the, that the British fishermen had to do a, 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 the flies were breaking off. So they did, they put a double uh, overhand around the fly's neck so it would stay on the line and it riffled. Mm. And that's how the British sailors, and that's all in Lee Wolf's book. Mm -hmm. huh. that's how so, you know, I not only tell people how to fish, but there are people who tell me how to fish. And the riffle hitch is murder. It's murder on striped bass, it's murder on trout, it's obviously murder on salmon. Did your writing and the pursuit of like stories, articles, photos, did that ever take away from the fishing for you or did it add to it? It added to it except I had an occasional one in a hundred, maybe 500, who hated me because okay. I was ruining Cape Cod. Oh. It's interesting to say that about the writing because it seems anyone who has written for any amount of time for larger publications gets that in some way. You know, I, I'm, Jerry, you've had the habit, I've had it, the guys that I've worked with over the years, whether it's um, justified or not, most of the time I'd say it's not justified, the hatred that they get from some people, but it does, there's some part of how fishing gets into some anglers' minds and then they have an outlet. They see you writing about the Cape and, oh, it's got to be your fault. Or, you know, the, someone, Tim Coleman was writing about Block Island, so it's his fault that there's too many people. You know, there's always yeah, yeah, someone yeah, blaming yeah. someone yeah. for that, whether it's appropriate well, or not. I want to remember something. I can see it in your the line questioning that I was a Cape Cod guy, but I was a Rhode Island guy. Mm -hmm. What used to happen... In, and I think it's still happening. In August, we get this red weed on a cape. I don't know if they still happen. Yep, absolutely. Yes, we and do. It, it's, it's a pain in the ass. Yep, it's terrible. So, when that happens, the first hint of red weed head for Rhode Island. That's why we caught so many fish in Rhode Island. Because we were rising there the first week in August. Mm. And... Uh, I was a, I was a house pet of Ray Jobin. Mm -hmm. Did, have you ever heard about Ray Jobin? Oh yes. He's a he's a he's a highliner. Yeah. And he was a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. So what would happen was, if it was starting to get good, and I, I don't know if he if he actually just wanted to see me, but I'd always get a, a card from him because there was no telephones and not, none of these things that you guys are carrying in those days. So what Ray would do is he'd put a, a postcard on it. He'd write, Frank, they stocked the pond. That told me that they had, he had fish there. So we would pack everything in the, in the big camper. We didn't have a chase in those days. Mm -hmm. And we'd head for, the, for Rhode Island. And uh, So that's interesting. So, I mean, Toby and I, we disagree with most people on this, but most people think that August is like time to hang it up. Oh, they're, they're done fishing. Oh, 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 no. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, right. But you, so you obviously loved August in Rhode Island. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, somewhere over time, like you were saying, you know, striped bass don't, can't see at night and they don't feed in August. These things become. But I had fruits. a guardian angel in Rage Oven mm -hmm. because he would. He would he would send put me a card. They stocked a pond, because I was not because I was on the shore and he was in a boat. I was never a threat to him. Right. So I couldn't hurt him, and he he really didn't want to hurt me. Right. We were we became very, also we were members of the same club. Mm -hmm. I caught we had a point system. Not we, Schaefer had a point system back then. There was a Schaefer contest. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I used to my family used to carry the the surf section for the Woonsocket Striper Club, and Ray would carry the boat section of the Woonsocket Striper Club. And uh, Those are good connections to have. <laughs> huh? That's a good connection to have. You bet. Yeah. You bet it was. Yeah. So one night, we're catching fish, and Ray is catching fish. So he pulls up about maybe 50 or 60 yards out, and he gives me the signal with the light. I said, I don't want to answer him because I'm afraid he's going to scare my fish. 
And then he finally after boom, 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 does it a few times and I don't answer him. He says, come on, Frank, answer me. <laughs> <laughs> so he yells you from shit. And then about the me. next time I saw him on the beach, we used to, we used to meet on the beach. And uh, he had a camper over in, uh, in a Charleston Breachway, like the commercial parking lot. Mm -hmm. And I, I stayed in the camper on the beach. Mm. Across the breachway, the west side of the breachway, which was East Beach. <laughs> yep. Yeah. 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 yeah right. So that, that that that's what that's what screwed Dave Pickering. So anyway, that's another story. You got so many stories. <laughs> uh, Ray says to me afterwards, "How come you wouldn't answer me?" I says, "I was afraid you'd scare the fish." Oh. Jesus. So we talked, this and that. We got over that. And uh, we had a, he, I, I, I visited him. I was just coming from the Cape. And uh, we, I had a beer with him in his camper. I, sw I swam across the breachway in the back and come up out of the water and got over the, he went, I went over to his camper. I knew his camper. And he had, we, had, we sat together, gave me a towel and dried me off. And then uh, I had a couple of beers with him, and I said, I gotta, I gotta go back, I gotta take a nap, because I'm going out tonight. Okay, he says, hey, I'll give you a ride. Oh, okay. So I get in the boat, and go off the breachway. <laughs> we get down the beach opposite my camper. I said, there it is. I says, uh, you gonna drop me off? He says, I can't go on that surf. <laughs> He says, he says, you swim across the breach where you can swim in. I says, okay. So I take my pants off that I had held over my head when I crammed across the breachway because it wasn't that deep. And every, the women were all sitting on a, in chairs, in there, these folding chairs. And this fool is getting ready to jump off the boat and raise. Ray is worried about the waves, you know? Yeah. So he backs off as much as he can, and he says, go. I says, I can't, it's too deep. And he kicks me in the ass over, over <laughs> into the water. And I hit, I hit eight feet of water with my pants over my head. And everybody on the beach is laughing. Who's that fool holding his pants <laughs> over, my, over his head? Remember that? <laughs> That's too funny. That's but too Ray funny. and I, were very very close, and he's a he was a champion. He 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 carried on socket striper club, mm. and uh, he was good. Oh, selling the fish. I think it's in one of the books. I got friendly with my well my brother. I got my brother into going to East Beach because he mm -hmm. had never caught fish like that, and when he started going on East Beach with with me. His kid brother, he started catch, catching striped bass. When I found him on East Beach, he's got he got two rods out. He says I got it all covered. I got squid on that one and sea worms on that one. I got my brother to to fishing live eels. And my brother, oh one night, he says he's got the squid in this and uh, the sea worms on that. I walk right by him. I says hey good luck, Norm. That's my brother, Norm. Mm -hmm. I go out on the breachway. I got about, I don't know, three or four or five bass on Charleston Breachway, which I knew how to fish very well. Because I, I, I had two ways of fishing, and the west side of Charleston Breachway is not popular. Mm -hmm. People don't go there. Except, and they would have to have a buggy to get there. And uh, we were parking in the, it, there was a, a good self-contained area on, on East Beach where I stayed. And there was a guy there who was a striper fisherman. And he was a, uh, a, new, a Connecticut State Trooper officer. And uh, he says, he comes over and introduces himself. He says, uh, where are we getting all these fish? I says, right here. I don't think he believed me. 
He was what we used to call a quani rat. You ever hear that term? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Butch, his name was Butch, Butch Corkins. Did you ever meet him? Or no, nobody? I don't know him. Yeah, I was just, uh, you weren't even born. <laughs> so Butch, Butch is, uh, he looks at my equipment and he says, hey, you got a narrow squitter. I says, yeah. I says, my thumb gets crapped with a full-size squitter. Oh, I never thought of that. I says, hey, yes. I says this, the full-size squitter is too much, it's too far. So, but I said, the 145 is a little shorter, and I said, it, it works better, it's easier on your hand. He says, you got any more of them? Oh, I says, I got a ton of them. I says, people give them to me. So I gave him a 145 spool, and he changed everything around, and he had a 145. Mm -hmm. So we began to bond. So there was another guy. What was his name? He asked me, remember his wife was Gloria? Stevie O'Sella. Yeah. Oh, he was yeah. a Kwani. Did you know? Yes. Yeah. So St Stevie comes over one morning. He says, uh, I got a fish. He says, uh, you got the facilities to keep it. He says, I can't sell them anyway. He says, why don't you take my fish and sell it? I says, okay. So we go over to my box, and he brings the fish over. He says, why don't you put it down? I says, it's full. <laughs> <laughs> he, gives, he gives me this, his, his little 28-pounder or whatever he had but from Kwani. And when I opened the side box, some fish fell on the... <laughs> so my front box was full, and when you open the side box, the fish fall out. But I found room for his free fish, so I got his free fish from Kwani. Jesus, he says. And he was so proud that he caught this Those fish at Kwani. Those three fish in your boxes were full. That's funny. And my box was full. You know, you said, so your friend who was in the boat, yeah. he was hammering them. Yeah. Obviously, with all of this effort and also, frankly, with the money you were making from the fish, you could have had a boat. Why no boat? Oh, Christ. I'd rather have a sister on a whole house. <laughs> no. Why? Why? I believe, and it's probably unnecessary, surf casters are like Marines. They're different than the regular soldier. And surf casters don't catch as much, but they have more nuts. They're more balls, and they, they take more of a beating, and they keep coming back for more. I'm very proud of, of being a surf caster. I wouldn't be proud. It's something like, I think I said my analogy is, you're either a soldier or a Marine, but if you're a Marine, you're one little cut. In my case, I think in surf casting, we're a, more of a cut than a boat fisherman. Both fishermen, both fishermen set a course, put the line out, and they mix their cocktails. They don't even have they, they don't even have to dress for it. It's not the same. It's not the you same. Know? Yeah. And and I'll tell you something. A good surf caster, which I think we were, but we were also six of us. And w you know, we had a we called it the Russian trawler system. Did I ever explain that to you? Oh. Yeah. Ho, ho. <laughs> All right, here's what we do. We got a buggy. We're in, on the beach. Norset is 11 miles. Back beaches in P-Town is probably 30 miles. Okay. There were six of us. Every quarter of a mile, a Dano gets out. So that's a mile and a half of water. Now, we have prearranged signals. If one of the kids has, has made a contact, blink, 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 immediately I drive over to the kid and the others try to walk to the other kid and I, sometimes I pick them up and we zero in on that spot. But we've covered six uh, at a quarter of a mile apart, that's a mile and a half. Mm. You do that three times, you've done all of Cape Cod. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. And that's the Russian troll system. So you have like a team. I mean, your family was a team. That's the thing. You guys were a team that really worked hard together. I've had a circus writing about her and the four kids because there were so many things that happened. Like, I could never tell the twins apart. So I called them both Peanut Head. The reason why they were called Peanut Head is that when they were born, they were preemies. Twins are always small, very small. How, old, how big were the twins, four? Four and a half and five. Four and a half and five. Yeah. They were so small that their head was a little bigger than a walnut or a golf ball, okay? So I call them peanut head, both of them. No, I, I, I'm digressing. It's okay. <laughs> I so digress that, so much I forget the story. It's okay. Tell. So the family was a team, though. Like you guys oh, worked as a well-oiled no, there team. There was no question about it. Yeah. Now the only thing that happened was a, there was a little bit of, a little bit of. Uh, I had an arrangement, a bonus system. The, what are you laughing? You already read it. I, I think I remember. Yeah. Yeah. And the bonus system was to keep them in the water because they catch a lot of fish. And so I used to give them like, when they got through with a good night, I had $150 and they had five. <laughs> and they'd take the five and they'd go into town and they'd buy Tootsie Rolls and licorice, <laughs> all kinds of candy. Yeah, that's fun, that's fun. Now how, and, when, when you had them like that with you, out on the beaches through the whole summer, did they, did they really enjoy it? Did they oh, love being? Geez. Was there any, you know, when the spring only thing came they, around, they The only thing wait. they didn't enjoy is, I used to get this, Susan took my spot. <laughs> Sandra took my spot. And, uh, but no, they, they loved it. They now, loved it. Because did, they were fishing for Tootsie Rolls and, and licorice. Yeah. Now, did they want to, when, you, when they first started joining you on the beach, was that like they... Like, you know, mom, dad, we want to join you? Or was it you guys like, hey, give this a try? And I'm just comparing it in my head with my son, where I waited until he wanted to join me, granted on a different level. But did they sort of initiate it, or did you just bring them along because you were on the Cape already? I taught them how to fish. Mm -hmm. If they know how to fish, and they do what his father, their father says, they're going to fill the boxes. And they did what their father said. They caught the fish, and they filled the boxes. Mm. Was there other kids fishing? Like, like, cause I was no, no, there weren't. Put their kids to bed. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's what I, that's what I figured. So they must have loved that, though. They must have been like, ah, we're staying up late, you know. It must have been fun. Look at Susan today. That's right. Yeah, she yeah. still loves it. <laughs> She's. Yeah. And the reason why Wonderful Sandra sports. is not, she, Sandra doesn't live here, but for a while she was doing some fishing in Louisiana, but now she's a grandmother. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, it slipped away from Sandra, but it sure as hell didn't slip away from Susan, as yeah. you can see by, yep. you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. I, I just picture the kids, you know, these days, kids being out on the beach, essentially just with the family, alone, really. I don't know. I don't know if a lot of kids would be able, they wouldn't want that these days, I don't think. Too many other distractions. Too many other distractions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They I mean, I would have loved it. I know I would have loved it. This has been a weekly edition of the Surfcast podcast. You can find out more about the podcast and find more episodes at surfcastpodcast.com. And be sure to check us out on social media at the Surfcast podcast.